Hello everyone. I'm grateful for the opportunity to give a presentation at this virtual meeting. My name is Dr. Santosh Sanagopali and I'm a gastroenterologist at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, uh, where I head the esophageal disorders service. In my practice, I see a lot of patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. And today I wanted to provide a bit of an introduction to this condition and address some of the common questions I get asked when I meet someone for the first time after making a diagnosis of this condition. And so I hope, I hope you find this talk useful. So the first and most obvious question is, what exactly is this condition, eosinophilic esophagitis? Well, put succinctly, it's a chronic, so i.e. meaning a long-lasting um, allergic condition affecting the esophagus. And for short, we often will just refer to it as EOE. Now you might ask why we have to give it such a long and difficult to pronounce name. Well, I'll try and break it down for you so you can understand what this term actually means. So the first part of the, the second term, esophagitis, refers to the esophagus. And the esophagus is a long, thin, muscular tube which goes from the back of the throat to the stomach. Itis is simply the medical term referring to inflammation. So the word esophagitis simply means an inflamed or swollen esophagus. And eosinophilic refers to a specific type of white blood cell called eosinophils. And these are the type of cells which predominate when we look under the microscope in a person with eosinophilic esophagitis. And you can see in this slide here, which is a, a microscopic specimen of a patient with EOE, a lot of reddish colored cells, and they are the eosinophils that are a, a major factor in this condition. So that's where the term eosinophilic esophagitis is derived from. So the next question is, why did I get this condition? Well, we know it typically happens in people who are prone to allergy and allergic conditions. It's most closely linked to a group of conditions called atopic disorders. And these include things like asthma, eczema, and hay fever. And most patients with eosinophilic esophagitis either have one of these conditions or had them earlier in their childhood and outgrew them. It's very common for patients with eosinophilic esophagitis to have previously diagnosed, been diagnosed with some sort of food allergy. And the question then obviously arises is, where are all these allergies coming from? Well, that's a very good question. We don't know for sure, but we do have something called the hygiene hypothesis, which basically states that allergic conditions are on the rise in Western industrialized countries because children no longer get exposed to as many childhood infections as they once did. And this may be leading to a problem with the immune system, which leads to allergies being formed. So before moving on to the symptoms that occur in this condition, we need to know what the normal function of the esophagus is. And basically the esophagus is, is just a pipe. And this pipe is responsible for the transport of swallowed food and drink into the stomach. And this partially happens just via the effect of gravity, but also through the actions of muscles in the wall lining the esophagus. And these contract sequentially, i.e. in sequence, in a process called peristalsis, which pushes the swallowed food down into the stomach. What are the symptoms of EOE? Well, actually the symptoms vary quite significantly based on whether the condition is present in an adult or a child. In adults, the most prominent symptom is trouble swallowing. And in medical terminology, we call this dysphagia. Now patients may refer or feel this trouble swallowing in different ways. 
Some people might feel as though food gets stuck as they try and swallow or as it travels down the neck or chest. Others may feel as though food takes food simply takes a long time to get down and they might have to chew excessively. In some severer cases, in more severe cases, sorry, um, there can be food impaction where a piece of food gets stuck or or f is felt as though it's stuck in either the neck or the chest for a prolonged period and this can sometimes range from minutes to even hours and sometimes might even necessitate the person coming into hospital for an emergency endoscopy to extract the piece of food. Chest pain can also be a feature in in some adults as well as heartburn which is a burning sensation felt behind the breastbone. In children, however, the symptoms can be much more varied and uh, a little harder to predict. So things can include vomiting, abdominal pain, the child may not be growing well, and they may be labelled as slow or fussy eaters. In adolescence, the symptoms can, uh, they may present with symptoms from both of these, these types. How might EOE affect my life? Well, we already discussed some of the symptoms that arise from the esophagus in EOE, which might affect the patient. Some patients with EOE also may have to have dietary limitations. And this might first, uh, one way in the diet might be limited is in, in the types of consistencies that can be eaten. For example, some patients with EOE are not able to eat very hard, firm, chunky textures very easily. Another way in which the diet might be limited is, is the need to avoid certain culprit or allergen foods, so foods that have been identified in the patient to be their trigger. Patients with EOE might also have to have periodic endoscopies for various purposes, including making a diagnosis, for monitoring of the condition, and sometimes also to deliver therapy for the condition. While there are all these different ways that EOE might affect a patient, we aim to minimize the effect of of the condition on the patient's life by providing effective therapy to get the condition under control. Some, uh, something that some patients are, are very understandably concerned of is the risk of cancer. However, we, we, don't, uh, we don't believe that there is any increased risk of, of developing cancer of the esophagus in patients who have eosinophilic esophagitis. So what might happen if I don't do anything? Well, this is a, uh, a simple representation on the different stages of the condition. So on the far most left panel, we have a normal, healthy, light pink appearing esophagus. Um, and the first uh, change that happens is the esophagus becomes inflamed. So we see in the second panel, a very reddened and swollen looking esophagus. And at the bottom, under the microscope, we can see that the esophagus has become infiltrated with these red eosinophils. As the condition progresses to the third and fourth panel over time, uh, there can be different changes that occur. So the esophagus sometimes is not as reddened or inflamed, but it has become scarred, or what we term in medical terminology as fibrotic. And this can lead to a, a wall of the esophagus that is thicker than normal, and this leaves less space through the center of the esophagus for the food to go through, so we have a narrowed esophagus. Under the microscope, we see not only the red eosinophils, but there's a lot of scar tissue present as well. So these changes, or different phases of the condition, um, these take many years to occur, and so in children we, we see less of the scar tissue and more just an inflamed esophagus, whereas in an adults we see, it, it's, it's mostly in adults where we see the scarring occur. It's also important to note that not all patients with eosinophilic esophagitis will progress down this path, and there may be some adults who've had the condition for many years who don't have a scarred and narrowed esophagus. Can EOE be cured or treated? 
Well, at present, there is no cure for the condition, unfortunately. However, we do have several effective treatment options available. And by using these effective treatment options, we aim for our patients to be, swallow, to be able to swallow freely, maintain their healthy weight, and not be bothered by significant pain or discomfort. Now, I won't go into detail about the treatment of EOE because that will be covered by other speakers at this, um, this conference. However, I will say in brief that the treatment of EOE really, is, um, really includes two different aspects. Now, the first facet of treatment is to get the inflammation under control. And we have three treatments to do this. Uh, probably the most commonly used treatment and, and the one for which we have the most evidence for is swallowed topical steroids. And these are, uh, and many of the, the patients with EOE would be familiar with medicines such as flixotide or, or budesonide, which are basically repurposed asthma medications which we get the patient to swallow. The second type of medication which can be used in eosinophilic esophagitis are what's called PPIs or proton pump inhibitors. And these are tablets that can be used um, which can also be effective in the condition. And the third form of therapy to treat the inflammation is diet. And the way diet works in brief is by trying to identify the specific trigger foods in that individual and getting them to avoid or eliminate those foods from the diet. The second component of therapy is to treat any scarring or what we call stricturing that has already developed. Strictures, if they've developed, are not responsive to any of the anti-inflammatory therapies that we've just discussed. And the only way they can be treated is by a process called dilatation, which is a procedure that can be performed during endoscopy, where we are, we are essentially stretching open that scar tissue to make the esophagus less narrow. The final question which I'll address today, which is also a very common one I get, is whether acid reflux or GORD is related to EOE. Now to answer this question, I have to explain to you what exactly is gastroesophageal reflux disease or GORD. So acid reflux is a condition where normal stomach acid inappropriately rises up into the esophagus, where it's not really meant to be. Once this stomach acid comes into the esophagus, it can lead to inflammation in the esophagus and it can also cause troublesome symptoms. So it really is quite a different disorder to EOE, whereas we discussed how EOE is an allergic condition affecting the esophagus, gourd or acid reflux is really quite a mechanical condition caused by um, inappropriate acid within the esophagus. However, there are several overlapping features of the two conditions. Firstly, and most obviously, they both do affect the esophagus. The symptoms of these conditions can overlap. In particular, the symptom of heartburn or burning behind the breastbone can be felt in both acid reflux and EOE. The treatments can overlap too. So, in particular, proton pump inhibitors, which we discussed on the previous slide, were actually initially developed for the treatment of acid reflux, and they are still the most common medication used in acid reflux. And while they are two different conditions, they, both EOE and GORD can coexist within the same patient, so you can have both. So this can sometimes cause some difficulties in diagnosis, but an experienced esophageal physician should be able to discriminate between the two and, and treat you appropriately. So in summary, eosinophilic esophagitis is an allergic condition affecting the esophagus. As we discussed, it can affect your ability to swallow and can cause other troublesome esophageal symptoms. In some patients, when it's left untreated, it could lead over time to a, a scarred and very narrow esophagus. However, we do have several safe and highly effective treatment options available now so that we, we not, in my practice, I aim for all my patients with EOE to, 
to really have a good quality of life and, and not be severely impacted by the condition. Thank you.